Shalom, this is Pastor Roy from Messiah House here in Lake Worth, Florida. And today, uh, for Torah Tuesday, we're talking about a very important subject, and it's a subject that a lot of people run away from, and they don't know anything about. It's something that is very important for your eternal well-being, and that's the study of holiness. Kedoshim, be holy. So let's get right into our Torah portion today, because it's an important one, and it's something that the Lord wants us all to really understand and get a good handle on, because again, it's vital for you. We want to get the concept of holiness because holiness is something. A lot of people say, well, I'm saved by grace. I don't need the law. You don't, you have, if you have come to that kind of conclusion, you have been deceived and you are robbing yourself of all kind of wonderful things that the Lord has for you because the New Testament tells us to be holy as well as the Old Testament. So understand this is a subject that is crucial for all of us who walk with Jesus in our lives today. Do you want to be close to the Lord? Do you want to grow in Jesus? Do you want to have any kind of spiritual fruit in your life? You need to understand what holiness is all about. And so the subject for today, and it's Old Testament again and New Testament, is be holy. All of us need to be holy and understand what holiness is actually talking about. And we're going to be looking at First Peter, the letter of Peter, and we're also going to be looking at Paul's letter to the Corinthians in First Corinthians. So understand that in both of these letters that we're talking about in the New Covenant, Paul and Peter are addressing the questions that believers had about this subject of holiness. And we see in chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians what it's talking about. There's questions that are being asked. The first question is, should one believer take another believer to court to settle a dispute? And the answer that Paul gives is that you're, you're, you are better qualified to judge than any other human because you have the Holy Spirit. You're a child of God. You should know better. And this is one of the ways that we understand what we're talking about is how we deal with the world around us. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. It couldn't be more clear. And again, remember, this is the new covenant. You're saved by grace, and I don't need the law. Well, if you have, if this is you, if you're sexually immoral, and if you're a idolater, and you're an adulterer, etc., if you have unrepented of sin in any way, shape, and form, you're in spiritual trouble, and you need to pay attention to what you're being taught here today about holiness. It's important. It says in 1 Corinthians 6.11, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Holy Spirit of our God. The Holy Spirit draws us to holiness. The Holy Spirit helps us to become holy. He cleanses us of our sin by the blood of Jesus and by the word of God. And where we, we are sanctified, we're set apart for his service. This is supposed to be the goal of every believer. And if you're just sitting there in the swill of I'm saved by grace and you've got sin mounting up in your life and you have no control over what you're doing in your life, your, your, uh, your nature is becoming contemptible and foreign to what the Bible has for you, you need to pay attention today. And then question number two that is written. Since we are made right with God by faith rather than by works, why are we still concerned with the commandments and statutes? And that's exactly what we're talking about here today. And Paul wrote this to them about this very subject. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Sin destroys. The wages of sin is death. And Paul and Paul is agreeing with them that we're allowed to do anything. And by the grace of God, everything's available to us. But not everything is healthy for you. It's not good for you. It'll lead you into a life that you can't control. How many people that have been hooked on drugs and alcohol ever entered into the life of alcoholism and drug abuse? by saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to be an alcoholic. Hey, I'm going to be a drug abuser. 
Nobody has ever done that. But they get into a place where they can't control it any longer. And this is Paul, what Paul is talking about. I'm, he said, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. What have you become a slave to is a question you need to ask yourself. He goes on, he says, the body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Who do you belong to? What is your heart's desire? What is your desires in your life? Do you want to be close to the Lord? Is That should be the most important thing in your life. And if you want to get close to the Lord, you should desire to walk in a moral way. The body is not, is not meant for immorality. We're, we, we were born into sin. We were born into slavery in our bodies. And if you let loose and if you allow those tendencies and desires to take hold of you, you'll fall into depravity. And even though you call yourself a believer, you've gone away from what God's word says, and you have the slavery upon you. And don't make excuses for it, but pray about how to get back to the Lord. And we get back to the Lord by his power. It, Paul wrote, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. And the power of the resurrection is the secret to us overcoming sin in our life. Our focus should be on the hope of our calling. In chapter 15, Paul will explain that our bodies are like seeds. One day each will die and be planted in the ground, and God will raise us up and give us new bodies. But when we plant seeds, we can't expect to see healthy sprouts if we don't plant healthy seeds. So the behavior that you're going through today is going to reflect in time, and you need to sow the good seeds that the Word of God would have you sow. As we prepare for the resurrection from the dead, we need to seek the Lord and allow Him to keep our bodies, souls, and spirits acceptable to Him. He's looking at you. He's desiring for you to be close to Him. And Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ god wants to take care of us but you have to side with him in order for this to happen in another place paul put it like this if by any means i may attain to the resurrection from the dead we need to look at the resurrection. It's the focal point of our spiritual walk in Jesus, and we want to walk in his resurrection power. Paul wrote, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Doesn't make any sense. And he goes on and says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Do you want to be uh, united with the world? Do you want to be yoked to someone and somebody or something that is not of God? Because you can't have both. You can't be yoked to God and be yoked to the world at the same time. We're to come out of this stuff. It, he goes on and says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God with your body. So this is something, and remember again, this is New Covenant. This is New Testament. This is how we are to walk in the Spirit before the Lord our God today as it concerns Jesus Christ, who, who we live by His grace. But understand that we need to flee these things and walk the way the Lord desires for us to walk. In other words, we are to be holy. And this is the entire theme of Kedoshim in this Torah portion because how do you walk in holiness? How can we be holy? It's a, it's a concept in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and we need to be very aware of this. As we look at this week's Torah portion in a few minutes, we'll find that this 1 Corinthians reading by Paul outlines the same moral constraints that Mark called, called, that Mark called out people of God. Believers in the Mashiach, in Jesus the Messiah, are to be free from the sin that pervades surrounding culture. 
and in particular free from sexual immorality, which is actually idolatry. As we read our Torah portion for this week, we will find that there was no atonement for cleansing provided in the law for sexual sins. The offenders had to bear their own sin. Consider all that King David suffered after his sin with Bathsheba. And you see this is continuous, and it's a, it's a big revelation to many people, but sexual sin is a very serious deal before the Lord. Now, considering that Jehovah God of Israel is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the follower of the Mashiach Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is not exempt from the call to personal holiness. We are all called to personal holiness, and we need to walk upright before the Lord. So understand that this Torah portion today about holiness is something that is not, there's no uh, opposition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are perfectly one. People that say they don't need the Old Testament don't know really what they're talking about at all. So as we apply this messianic application, we're seeing the coming together of the Torah, the law of God, with what Jesus talked about, about grace in the new covenant. It is all the same thing. Then First Peter, the, the concept of a living hope is brought up. The New Testament reading for this parasha echoes the Torah portion's call to holiness. In the passage from First Peter, the call to holiness is, predict, is predicated upon the hope that will be brought to you. The hope that will be brought to you. Quote, hope that will be brought to you. Unquote. At the revelation of Yeshua at the end of days. So we don't always see the end from the beginning, but we have this hope in us about Jesus coming back. And that should instill a desire in us to walk in holiness before the Lord. The, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it is not yet revealed what we will be. But we know that when he is revealed, he we will be like him, for we will see him just as he is. Everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself even as he is pure. This brings us to Kedoshim, be holy. Peter wrote, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Have you Do you have the revelation of Jesus Christ? It should inspire you to walk in holiness if you know Jesus, if you know who he is, if you have any idea of the hope of your calling, and if you have any hope of the revelation of Jesus Christ in your life, it should make you desire to walk in holiness. It says in Jeremiah that the Lord will put his law, he will write his law in our hearts. This is exactly what it's talking about. Peter goes on, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the, to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, in all your conduct. There's no compromise here. There's no uh, holding on to this or holding on to that. In all your conduct, you need to be walking in holiness before the Lord your God, for it is written, be holy, for I am holy. This is what Peter was getting at. Because the of the revelation that Jesus has given us, it inspires to walk in holiness, and we want to be holy like he, Jesus, is holy. Not as slaves of sin, it says in Romans 6.20. As slaves of sin, you are not under obligation to righteousness. Are you a slave to sin? Too many believers today are slaves of sin, and they have never been taught to walk in holiness or to walk outside the bounds of, of, the, of the slavery of this world. As slaves of sin, you are not under obligation to righteousness. We do want to be under the obligation of righteousness. This is what gives us our freedom. Paul wrote, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now... But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. 
the Holy Spirit brings us to this life and holiness at the revelation of Jesus in our lives. It puts within us the desire to walk away from the world and toward Jesus and the resurrection power that only he has. So with these thoughts in mind, let's let's look at our Torah portion today at Kedoshim, because these this is a very important subject. Many people that are, are slaves to their own sin, and they make excuses about, oh, I'm saved by grace. You can tell how saved you are by what you're a slave to. And understand, there's no doubting about it. You have to understand that this is a very real life we live with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. He sets us free to walk away from the filth of the world. So Kedoshim means holy ones. And when, in our theme today of be holy, this is exactly what we're looking at in Scripture. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 19 through chapter 20, verse 27. And this is the parashat Kedoshim. And it begins with the call for the Israelites to be holy, or Kadosh, on account of their relationship with Kadosh Israel, the Holy One of Israel. The portion, therefore, focuses on defining a holiness code that contains more commandments regarding practical ethics than any other portion of the Torah. It begins with Jehovah saying to Moses, You shall be holy, for I, Jehovah, your God, am holy. It says in Leviticus 19.2, the word of the Lord, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. This is the standard. You see the standard in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Tanakh and in the Brit Harashah, you see, be holy, for I am holy, thus says the Lord. So let's look at this question, and, and it's an important question that believers need to understand. What is holiness? In Hebrew, the word Kedusha from the root kadosh means sanctify or set apartness. Other Hebrew words that use this root include kadosh, kadush, which is sanctifying the wine, the kaddish, which is sanctifying the name, kedushin, the ring ceremony at a marriage, and so on. Kadosh connotes the sphere of the sacred that is radically separate from all that is sinful and profane. As such, it, it is, it is uh, lofty and elevated. It talks about it in Isaiah 57, beyond all comparison and utterly unique. This is holiness, talked about again by Isaiah in chapter 40, 25. It is entirely righteous, Isaiah 5, 16. Glorious and awesome, the psalmist says in Psalm 99, 3. Full of light and power, Isaiah 10, 7. And is chosen and favored as God's own. This is Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-six. 26. Indeed, holiness is a synonym for Jehovah himself, HaKadosh Baruch Ha, who, the Holy One, blessed be he, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And you have to understand, this is a very important subject before the Lord your God. This is one he wants you and I to pay attention to. So we need to understand what the word talk is holy actually means. Holy is, is a word that means set apart, and it's the opposite of holy is common or profane. The idea of the holy, therefore, implies differentiation. The realm of the holy is entirely set apart from the common, the habitual, or the profane. It is something different. It is not common. And you have to understand, it is you and I to be set apart. The holy one is singular, awe-inspiring even terrible or dreadful, as we see in the scriptures. In Nehemiah, the prophet said, I said, I beseech you, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. The Psalm 68, 35 says, O God, thou art terrible out of thy, ho out of thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. As the Holy One, HaKadosh, God is utter, utterly unique, distinct, sacred, and set apart as the only one of its kind. He alone is worthy of true worship and adoration, since he alone is peerless, without rival, 
and stands in relation to the world as creator and Lord. Yes, only Jehovah is infinitely and eternally other known to himself as I am that I am that we see in Exodus chapter 3, 15. Understand he is God and there is no one like him. God's holiness is something that we need to we need to worship, we need to exalt, we need to understand. We need to understand that God's holiness compared to man's sinfulness especially. Holiness then implies more than an abstract or indifferent metaphysical separation as is, as is suggested by various forms of dualism, but rather separation from that which is mundane, banal, common, or evil. In other words, Holiness implies absolute moral goodness and perfection. It is impossible that the Holy One could condone sin, since this would negate the distinction between the sacred and profane and thereby undermine the nature of holiness itself. The holy is in opposition to the profane, and therefore Jehovah must hate and oppose that which violates the sacred. He is holy. One of the first acts of Jehovah in the created order was the separation of the heavenly light from darkness. And re as recorded in Genesis 1-4, it says, And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, or from the holy from the profane. And we see, and, and God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. This is a very important and key point for us. This verse suggests that the realm of the holy, represented by the divine light, is conceptually distinct from the world with its imperfections, though it could manifest itself within the world as long as its integrity was strictly maintained. And we see this tension all the way throughout man's history. In practical terms, relating to human beings and their relationship to God, holiness describes a state of consecration, produced by ethical separation from profane culture. So we are all called to this holiness, and we have to understand that this is light versus darkness. You're called to be in the light, not in darkness. And we see this theme throughout the scriptures, and the Lord, his light is what we desire. Now, three times in this parasha, in Kedoshim, is the call to holiness made. One, it says, you shall be holy, for I, Jehovah, your God, am holy. Leviticus 19.2. Two, it says, consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am Jehovah, your God. That's in, found in Leviticus 20, verse 7. And three, it says, you shall be holy to me, for I, Jehovah, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. This is in Leviticus 20, 26. So three times we see that we are called to holiness. In other words, we're called to be in the light, not in the darkness. God makes the separation, but you have a free will, and you have to choose that you want to be in the light and not in the darkness. So we are called by the Torah from God's word to be holy, and we have to make the choice that we're going to walk in holiness. It's, it should be very simple, but it's something that the devil fights very hard, and the Lord pulls us toward this holiness. Because Jehovah is holy, if they engaged in idolatrous and profane practices, the Israelites could not be in relationship with him. They were therefore called to be separate from all that was unholy. You see throughout the Torah that people are separated from the main body from because of some sin or something that made them unclean in their lives. This is very consistent throughout the Torah. God does the separating between the holy and the profane or the common. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And this is also an allusion to the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that we see in Genesis 3.15. Now, the Israelites, their call to holiness was based on the fact that they were God's possession because he had separated them from the nations. He was dealing with his people, and they promised that they would be his people, and he was working with them. 
It says, and you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So God is the one who initiated the separation between Israel and all of the other nations. Now you ask yourself today, and you look at the Old Covenant, you see the Torah, and you ask yourself, is this for Jews only? Well, this is an important question because some people say, oh, it's, this only refers to Jewish people because they were part of Israel. No, 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 no. Let's look at what the scripture actually says. Paul wrote in the New Covenant to the first believers in Ephesus, and Ephesus was actually was in Asia Minor, Asia Minor, which is not Israel. And he wrote, he said, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. He made no illusion about their DNA. He made no illusion about their nationality. If because they believed in Jesus, they were God's holy people, or God separated people, and they were in Ephesus, which was not in Israel. So you see that the word of God from Genesis through Revelation is for all of God's holy people who adhere to it and consider to be God's word. It's for all of us who believe. God's purpose was that we Jews, who this is in Paul's thinking, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, as he's writing to the Ephesians, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own giving by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. It's spelled out very clearly. It's about those who believe in Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, and it has nothing to do with just he, he's made them separate over there in Israel. And this is only for them. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ opened the door for all the nations to come to the Lord. So we see in Leviticus, we see this what we can call the holiness code in chapters 17 to 27. And it says, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord, your God. This is for everyone. It's not just for the nation of Israel. It's for all Israelites who trust in Jesus Christ. The holiness code for God's people begins with a restatement of the fourth and fifth of the Ten Commandments, namely the commandment that we should respect our parents and grandparents and keep the Sabbath. We must esteem our parents' words, not speak when they are speaking, and regard them with honor. Now, connected with this commandment is the mitzvah of keeping the Sabbaths, which is plural of Jehovah, which includes the weekly Sabbath rest on Saturday, as well as the Moedim, the appointed times, or the feast, which are the Lord's feasts. They're not just Jewish feasts of the Jewish calendar. So Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. This, he's not talking to just Jewish people. He's talking to everybody who's a believer who would pay attention to what God's word is saying. And he is giving them the, the, the blessed uh, light that you need to flee from idolatry. It says in Leviticus, and it goes right along with it. Do not turn to idols and things of naught, or make yourselves molten gods. I, the Lord, am your God. You have to understand, God hates idolatry. He hated it in the Old Covenant. He hates it in the New Covenant. He hates it now. Idolatry only leads into demonic problems, and you need to understand that God's people need to get away from all idolatry. The Holiness Code continues with a restatement of the second of the Ten Commandments, namely the prohibition of idolatry called Avodah Zarah, which is strange service. It says in Leviticus 18.27, For the men who were in the land before you committed all these abominations, and the land has become defiled. All those, the Canaanites and all the tribes that were there before the children of Israel, they had defiled themselves in idolatry and perverse practices, and the Lord did not want his people to have anything to do with any of that. In Leviticus 18.28 says, 
And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. God had vomited out the nations in order to bring the children of Israel in, and he later vomited out the Israelites because they fell into these same idolatrous practices. This is a very serious subject before the Lord, and it's serious in the Old Covenant, and it's serious in the New Covenant, especially as it concerns spiritual things today. There's idolatry, much idolatry, all over the place, and believers in Jesus need to walk away from it. In a later parasha, we will read, it says in Deuteronomy 11, 11 and 12, but the land, whether you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. The Lord is always looking at these matters. So God gave certain guidelines for the use of anything the land will produce at the hands of his people. These are God's guidelines that he gave to us. He said in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. Notice how his, in his mercy he's taken care of those that are, are without, the destitute and the poor. Every farmer, and Israel was a very agri agricultural nation, every farmer was required to put aside a corner of his field for poor people to glean from the harvest. This mitzvah is called pieah, peya, which means edge. Generally, a farmer would leave one-fiftieth of his crops as peya for the poor. Other commandments for farmers include leaving stalks for the poor and leaving harvested bundles for the poor that were accidentally left behind during the harvest. It says in Deuteronomy 15.10, Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. We are dependent, are we not, on the blessings of God in our lives. Just after these commandments regarding leaving your gleanings for others in Leviticus 19.11, it repeats the eighth of the Ten Commandments, indicating that forgetting the plight of the poor is equivalent to stealing from Jehovah's point of view. It's important before God how you treat the poor. He who has pity on the poor lends to the poor. He will reward him. It tells us this in Proverbs, the book of wisdom, that if you'll take care of the poor, the Lord's going to take care of you. It's, it's a promise that he has made for us, and it works both ways, doesn't it? It says in Leviticus 19.11, you shall not steal, you shall not lie, you shall not deceive one another. Aren't these traits that everyone in the world needs to understand and, and pay attention to? Lying in general is then prohibited, which repeats the ninth of the Ten Commandments. It says, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. This is a general series of commandments that forbids actions or intentions that defraud or mislead other people. The correlative positive virtue is that of a truth-telling, is that of truth-telling. Those who fear God will be upright in their communications. You have to understand that when you live your life before the Lord, you watch out what comes out of your mouth and you're not making foolish promises and you're not making oaths that you can't keep and so forth. You're not a liar. It says in Proverbs 12, 22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. Once again, when writing to the first believers in Ephesus, Paul wrote, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. He said, I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. And he wrote, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. You see, every one of us are not where we're going to be yet. Every one of us need to grow spiritually and otherwise. Just because you're older doesn't mean you're closer to the Lord. But you need to desire for God's holiness to take a hold of you. He will bring it to you if you have the desire. We will speak the truth in love. 
growing in every way more and more like Christ. You're not there yet, but you're wanting to grow in this fashion, who is the head of his body, the church. And it says in Leviticus 19.12, and it, it, it's perfectly in line with what Paul was writing. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. We need to watch what's coming out of our mouths. That's in the Old and the New Covenant. As God's people, we represent him in all our dealings with others. Because we serve him, people expect the way we behave to reflect his integrity. To be dishonest in our dealings is to cast dispersions on his integrity. Anybody that calls themselves a, a, a minister in the name of the Lord and is cheating people or is robbing people is dishonoring God because they're misrepresenting who God is. And it's a serious thing to say, as surely as Jehovah lives, I will keep my word and then not keep it. You have to understand a lot of believers are cut off from God because of what's coming out of their mouths does not line up at all with what his spirit is desiring for them. It says in Romans 2, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. People around the world are looking at the behavior of the believers, and it's a mess because the believers are not following up with what the Word of God is saying in the Torah and in the New Covenant because they've not paid attention to what the law of God says. They have perverted the, the message of God throughout the world, and we're seeing the results of this all over the place all the time. Leviticus 19.14 says, You shall not curse the deaf, or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Do you have the fear of the Lord? Do you understand that this is a very serious subject before the Lord? You may you may not feel like it's very important. It's hugely important that you walk in the ways of the Lord. If you have the Spirit of God, you're going to desire to walk according to God's law as you can understand it. That's why the Torah is so important, because it gives us the basic basics which are expounded upon by Jesus and the apostles in the new covenant. The commandment literally says, you shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but it means that we should refrain from all types of cruel or hateful speech or thinking in general. After all, if we are forbidden to curse someone who cannot hear us, are we not also forbidden from cursing someone who can? The prohibition of putting a stumbling block before the blind also means that we are not to be deceptive to others, misleading them or causing them to make a false step in their walk with Jehovah. You may not purposefully give misleading information or bad advice to others since that causes the other person to trip. You don't want to do that. Leviticus 19.15 says, You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You need to be the same with the people that have money and people that don't have money. With those that you think are important, that those that are not important, you should treat everybody the same with love and gentleness. Now, it is inevitable and psychologically necessary that we make judgments about other people. But this commandment says, in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor, implying that we are to be forgiving and good when we think of other people. Jewish scholars teach that we should always seek to excuse the perceived sins we see in others. It says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done. 
and that without partiality. This is what Paul wrote to the, Corinthians, the Colossians. But notice what he said right before that. He said, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And then it says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. That's God's judgment on sin. For there is no partiality with God. He sees all of us for exactly who we are. Now, this mitzvah is connected to the prohibition of speaking lashon hara, or speaking evil, even if the true reports about others by means of gossip. Gossip is a horrible sin in the body of Christ. And it says in Leviticus 19.16, You must not go about spreading slander among your people. You must not endanger the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Again, be careful what's coming out of your mouth. The Lord is listening. He's watching. And he knows exactly what's going on in your head and in your heart. And slander, the definition, slander is false or malicious speech. You have to understand it's, it's the content of your heart and the intention. Slander is false or malicious speech. Be careful. You shall not be a talebearer among your people. This, also, this is also a type of Lashon Hara, the evil tongue, that involves saying something bad about another person, even if it happens to be true. One who spreads gossip is considered motzira, someone who brings forth evil, because Third-hand information is often a source of misunderstanding, ill will, and confusion, confusion in the life of others. Jehovah demands truthful speech from us. Since gossip and idle talk invariably lead people into ill feelings and quarrels. Though you might see a character defect or fault in someone, let your righteousness constrain you to overlook the fault and regard others in the best possible light. Exodus 23, 7 says, have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. Understand that God is watching every phase of this world. He, he's watching the governments. He's watching who's in charge, the governors, and he's watching the people, and he's watching you as a believer in Jesus, the Messiah. You shall not stand idly when your neighbor's life is at stake. This is a commandment that we are not to be passive when we discover our neighbor is being falsely accused and his life is in danger. We have a duty to stand for the truth, to defend the powerless, and to walk in righteousness before Jehovah. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18 say, Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So we need to really look at our relatives, people, and fellow Israelites' neighbors and treat them all the same. Did you see four commandments in that one verse? It says, you must not hate your brother in your heart. This commandment extends beyond the idea of a flesh and blood brother. Since the verse continues with, you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Two, we must appeal to our neighbor when we see something that is sinful in their lives. In other words, all Israel is responsible to one another. And this means we will take the time and the risk to admonish our neighbors in the ways of righteousness. You see, and it says in Jude, and save others with fear, putting them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You take a risk when you approach somebody about something you see wrong. But this is what the law of God is telling us to do. Again, it's in the Old Covenant and it's in the New Covenant. Three, we are connected with this. Connected with this is the commandment. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge, which culminates in four. The essence of the law, its focal point and the very heart of what holiness represents. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, this sounds something that came that that we see in the new covenant, but this is actually Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Note that the direct object of the verb ahav, to love, is your neighbor. But who exactly is my neighbor? Some pharisaical types have claimed that the word for neighbor refers only to one's fellow Jew, not to others at large in the world. However, this is obviously false since the foreigner or stranger is explicitly identified to be an object of your love. It says the, in Leviticus 19.34, the foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And of course, Yeshua, the Mashiach, Jesus Christ, answered this question by turning it around. Instead of attempting to find someone worthy of neighborly love, I am asked to be a worthy and loving neighbor myself, like the good Samaritan, we see in Luke chapter 10. And this is Vahata Lareka Kamoka, love your neighbor as yourself. This is in our, in our liturgy every week. Love your neighbor as yourself. 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 This phrase, Vahafta Lareka Kamoka, is considered the most comprehensive rule of conduct toward others found in the entire Torah. Even the Jewish Rabbi Hillel, a contemporary of the Lord Jesus, commented regarding this phrase. He said, The golden rule, this is from Hillel the Elder, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. Yeshua said there in Matthew 7, 12, Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. How can you say that the new covenant is not talking about the law? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And Paul wrote, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. To the Galatians, Paul wrote, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So we need to really work on looking at our neighbor and loving him and doing for him as we would do for ourselves. Jehovah teaches us important matters in the Torah by putting it in front of our eyes in everyday life. We learn by repetition and by practice. In Leviticus 19, Jehovah gave more restrictions concerning farming. He forbids mixing two kinds of crops in the same field or allowing cattle to be interbred. He imprints the idea of purity and the separation of the holy and the profane in his people's minds. Purity, which means no mixture. And we need to understand that this is a very serious subject before the Lord. Jehovah teaches that even clothing should be pure, free from admixture of wool and linen. It's weird. Things are to be set aside. God's people are forbidden from eating fruit from a newly planted fruit tree. The Torah commands that if you plant a fruit tree, you may not eat any of its fruit for the first three years. You say, well, gee, what is going on here? I don't know exactly the science of it, but I know that the Torah tells us to do this. That's Leviticus 19.23. On the fourth year, all the fruit must be either brought to the temple as a sacrifice or sold in the money given to the temple. The first year's fruit of a tree is holy and belongs exclusively to Jehovah. It is regarded as separated from us. It says in Paul wrote to the Romans, and he's writing along these same lines in a spiritual vein. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So the, even the, the fruit trees needed to be consecrated properly before the Lord. And in the fifth year shall you eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9.10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of your righteousness. So you see how all of this mix in, but the Holy Spirit's 
the Holy Spirit gives us the revelation of what is actually being said. And it says in Exodus, you must not worship the gods of these nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. You must serve only Jehovah, your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water, and I will protect you from illness. Now you can get an understanding of why there's so much turmoil and sickness in the world, because people have not followed what the Torah has said. Leviticus 19, 26 through 28. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. You shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will turn to prostitution and will be filled with wickedness. Now, does this verse seem out of place to you? Here we are thinking about paganism and idolatry and God's command to worship only him. Why is this command related to sexual sin here? Because idolatry and carnality are forms of spiritual prostitution. A prostitute leaves the age-old norm of a woman, depending on a man who has authority over her to provide for her. She pours out her affections on others to gain the things a father or a husband should provide for her. You might expect this from a girl who has no father or husband. Each of us was born into sin. We inherited the sin nature. Because of sin, we were separated from our Father, our Provider. In our slavery to sin, our only recourse was to live as prostitutes, pouring out our affections on the world in order to gain the things we desired. It says in John 8, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. How many believers are stuck in sin, they're slaves to sin, and they have no concept of sin, even in their life, yet Jesus wants to set them free. Paul wrote, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, by which we cry, Abba, Father. We've been adopted into Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God, and we have every desire and every right in the world to come to him and ask for him to cleanse us and help us through this. This is what the law is meant to do for us. Paul wrote, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. We need to come into God's kingdom as little children and be imitators of God. Everything, study Jesus and, and try to emulate him in every way that you can. It says in Exodus 31, 17, notice the interchange here between the Old and the New Covenant. The concepts are always just the same. It is a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. So you have to understand, we need to respect God's law. We need to respect his word as God's word. It says, it goes on in Leviticus 19.32, Stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. Do not take advantage of foreigners who will live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Who is the Lord? He is the Lord, our God. How do, In the Leviticus portion today, how to practice honesty in business. Boy, do we need this in our world today. It says in Leviticus 19.35, Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights and honest and honest ephah and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. A false it says in Proverbs eleven one. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Just but a just weight is His delight. He's looking at the integrity of your heart, 
in your business dealings. There's no excuse for a believer to be cheating people or to be acting dishonestly. Leviticus 19.37 says, Ye shall observe all my statutes and ordinances, and do them. I am the Lord. Notice how the Lord is always continually reminding them who's boss and who's in charge of things. In Leviticus 22, Say to the Israelites, Any Israelite or any alien living in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech must be put to death. The people of the community are to stone him. So we look at Jehovah Makadesh, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. He cleanses us and he consecrates us for his own work. His own work. Anyone who dishonors father or mother must be put to death. Such a person is guilty of a capital offense. This is very serious before the Lord, and the death sentence was given to people who did not respect their parents. If your parents train you up in the ways of Jehovah, to abandon him is to dishonor your parents. The commandment to honor father and mother undergirds the commandment to serve only Jehovah. But obviously a person leaving a false, leaving a false religion of his parents to serve Jehovah will not be at risk of Jehovah's judgment. Paul wrote about the, along the same lines in Ephesians chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So all of these, again, are connected to themselves. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Notice that the Lord is putting these strong stipulations in to keep the children of Israel safe from sin. If a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. It's talking about, of course, homosexuality, which is, which is not allowed in the Old Covenant. The death sentence was attached to it. Or the New Covenant, spiritual death, is certainly attached to it. If a man lies carnally with a beast, he shall surely be stoned to death, and he shall slay the beast. Sex with animals? Are you kidding me? If a man slept with his sister, or if he had sex with a woman during her menstruation, he would be ostracized and suffer because of his guilt. If he lay with his aunt or his sister-in-law, he would suffer and be childless. There was no atonement or cleansing provided in the law for sexual sins. The offenders had to bear their own sin. Consider all that King David suffered after his sin with Bathsheba. Sexual sins, you bear them yourselves, and you will find that these are very important stipulations to understand. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and this is why in our Brit Hadashah portion, Paul warned us, flee sexual immorality. Every sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Having done these things before coming to the Lord is one thing. When we are born again, we become a new creation. Our Brit Hadashah portion tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, And such were some of you, but you were, but you are washed but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Holy Spirit of our God. He sa it says in John 8, 10, 11, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? This is when the woman is brought to Jesus caught in the act of adultery. And he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you condemn you, go and sin no more. But, continue, but to continue in these sins after coming to the truth would not be good for us. It would be willfully defying the word of God and blaspheming his name. This is something that we need to take very seriously. Hebrews 10, 26 says this, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. You, you just keep doing it over and over. It doesn't mean you're serious about it really at all. 
Leviticus 20, 22 says, you are therefore to keep all my statutes and ordinances so that the land where I am bringing you to live will not vomit you out. Remember that the Lord wants to keep the house of his people clean. It says, and you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. So God cast out the people that went in, that were in Israel before the Israelites came in, and he cast them out, or he vomited them out, just like he vomited out the, the children of Israel when they fell into the same sins. He says in Leviticus 20, 24, But I have said unto you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. And this is the understanding and the stance we need to understand. God has separated us from the world, and we need to see ourselves as separated from the world. Leviticus 20, 35 says, or 25, you are therefore to distinguish between clean and unclean animals and birds. Do not become contaminated by any animal or bird or by anything that crawls on the ground. I have set these apart as unclean for you. It's talking about things that God doesn't want you to eat. You shall be holy to me, for I am, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be me, should be mine. So we see that in the Torah portion today, these strictures that God puts in there, it's all about him setting up his people and trying to separate them by his holiness from the common or the profane or the wicked or the sinful. And we see this in Kedoshim in our in our uh in our uh, half Torah portion, we see this spelled out as well in Amos chapter 9, 7 through 15. This is Amos, the prophet. Amos was a shepherd who Jehovah raised up as a prophet during the reigns of Jeroboam II in, northern, in the northern kingdom of Israel and Uzziah in the southern kingdom of Judah. So the, while the kingdoms were both there, this is when Amos was doing his ministry. He was sent to a nation that thought the performance of the rites was all God required, just going through the motions. And with that done, they could do whatever they pleased, just like it is today. Without a commitment to God's law, they had no basis for standards of conduct. They were just doing it because it, it, they thought the rituals were just fine before the Lord. But remember, God judges the heart. Man judges by the outward appearance, but God judges by the heart. God gave Amos a list of charges to indict his people of. And he's speaking to both of the nations. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. And those who swear by the shameful idols of Samaria who take oaths in the name of the God of Dan and make vows in the name of the God of Beersheba, they will all fall down, never to rise again. So we see that in this Hathor portion, we're looking at God does not have any interest in you just going through the motions, doing it because, well, you're supposed to do it. No, he's looking at the heart and why you're doing it. He said, are you Israelites more important to me than the Ethiopians? Asked Jehovah. I brought Israel out of Egypt, but I also brought the Philistines from Crete and led the Armenians out of Kerr. Surely the eyes of the sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth, yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. This is judgment upon the northern kingdom and was partial judgment on the southern kingdom because God was dealing in fury against this religious system that they worked out and they weren't caring for the people. They were all doing it just because it was ceremonially right to do, just as we see much of it is done today. He said, for I will give the command and will shake Israel along with the other nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, yet not one true kernel will be lost. But all the sinners will die by the sword. All those who say nothing bad will happen to us. So you have to understand God has his plan of restoration for his people. But everything is done from the heart. 
God is looking at your heart and my heart, how we approach this amazing subject of holiness before the Lord. And what is God looking for? He's looking for a heart that desires him. He's looking for the you to have the fear of the Lord, to actually care what he thinks, what he says, what he desires for your life. How can you say that he's your Lord and you're not wanting to do what he tells you to do? In Amos 9.11, it says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And Israel will possess what is left of Edom, and all the nations I have called to be mine. Jehovah has spoken, and he will do these things. Now, Amos' contemporaries included other prophets such as Hosea, Joel, and Isaiah. God used Amos as a vigorous spokesman for God's justice and righteousness, but all was not gloom. It says in Amos 9, 13 to 15, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one, who tr one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land and never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And of course, we, we see this in Ezekiel chapter 36, which is a very important chapter. Starting in verse 22, it says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, This is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them, then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field, so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, house of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. You see, this is very important that we understand. And he goes on in verse 36. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, that, that I the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. As the holy flock, as the holy flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I have spoken. It shall come to pass. I will do it. You see, thus says Jehovah, be holy. He's going to work out the holiness of Israel. We see Israel is in the land even today, but they are not walking in any kind of holiness. In fact, they could not be even more perverse and sinful and wicked and antichrist as, as anybody in the world. But they're in the land, and God is going to deal with the whole world. 
and you're going to see God dealing with the children of Israel. You're going to see God dealing with the Jewish people in the last days, and they're going to be coming to Jesus Christ, the Lord, because this has been pronounced by the prophets, and this is going to happen. He, God will have holiness in his desired land, in his holy land. Thus says Jehovah, be holy. So we need, and you need, and I need to practice holiness right now. We need to all be holy. So this ends our Torah portion for today. And I want you to understand that this, this is subject of holiness is a subject you may not think is very important today. God thinks it's very important. In fact, God thinks it's so important. So much in the word of God in the old covenant and the new covenant are about this very subject. You want to walk in holiness and walk in separation from the world and seek the Lord and seek his face and have his spirit in you so that you can walk according to the way he wants you to walk. Be holy for he is holy. And that's his desires, his desire for all his children. And it will be done. It will come to pass. This will happen. And we need to start practice, practicing all of this today and every day throughout eternity. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.